Good morning. Happy to see all of you here today. I want to start with a story that's an illustration of a paradigm shift. How many are familiar with that concept? A few of you, good. Uh, all of you will be after I'm done with this story. Uh, a gentleman gets on a plane with three children, all under 10. And he is, seems quite detached from not only his children, but everyone else. Spends most of the flight with his head in his hand, hands. And his children are really quite poorly behaved, who are fighting with each other and getting up and down and creating all kinds of trouble for the stewardesses. And someone sitting nearby thinks to himself or herself, that father certainly isn't doing a good, very good job raising his children. They're wild and uncontrolled. Before the flight was over, this person had opportunity to talk with the father. And the father shared that the children's mother had just died and they had just finished with the funeral and burial. And he apologized that his children really didn't know how to react to that and that he was having a great deal of difficulty himself. The person who had passed judgment on that individual saw this circumstance in an entirely different way because of learning a bit more information. So I encourage you today uh, with that story and the scripture that um, that Bessie reminded us of. I want you to turn there with, in your Bibles, if you would, please, just to look at that once again. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 2. This is from the King James. Oops. I put my marker in the wrong place. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 2. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet, as he ought to know. So two weeks ago, I read the sermon by A.T. Jones, and he belabored this point quite a bit, actually. I thought a little bit much. But then again, many of us have really thick skulls, don't we? And we need to be reminded uh, there was a speaker who came here once, maybe more than once, uh, Eugene Pruitt, made the point that scripture doesn't have an influence on our lives unless we're thinking about it, unless we're aware of it, unless it's in our consciousness. That's why we need to refresh ourselves over and over and over again with the truths of God's word. It isn't enough to just read it and know it and understand it once. So, uh, I'm going to put a lot of scriptures on the, on the screen here. And they're all King James. However, I have with me the clear word and I'm going to be sharing quite a bit from, from this version of scripture. I should call it a paraphrase. Uh, but I have a word of caution, and I'll illustrate that a couple of different times if I remember along the way. Uh, the clear word is, is one man's understanding of scripture, and it's a paraphrase, it's not a version. It's not uh, necessarily true, a true translation from the original language. However, uh, because of that, let me say that 
I don't think it's something that we should use as a study tool for scripture, for understanding scripture, except that here's the, the place where I think it fits in very well. Some of you may have had the experience like I have had where you read certain passages of scripture and your eyes sort of glaze over and you wonder what in the world is this saying? Anybody ha have that happen to you? Okay, I'm not alone, I'm good. Uh, <clears throat> and this, the clear word allows you to read a passage and get the basic understanding very easily, if not more details. Uh, and it opens to one's understanding, and then you can go back to your, your study text, whether it's King James or New King James or New American Standard or whatever it is that you use for your study Bible. You can go back to that with new understanding, a better perspective, sort of like the paradigm shift story that I told about. So let's begin. We're going to start with um, Colossians chapter 1. And I have there verses 14 to 16. But I want to, um, this is such a beautiful passage of scripture that focuses on Christ. I appreciated the special music this morning. Focus on Christ. Um, Colossians. I've told you before how I remember where these four books are in the Bible. They come right after Corinthians, but we have um, Gen, well, let me tell you first, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians which, if you remember the acronym uh, General Electric Power Company, can help you remember what order they're in. Okay, Colossians chapter 1, and we have verses 14 to 16 up there, but I want to go back uh, to verse 12, and I'll probably read on past 16. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us, from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, and for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. So Jesus is a pretty important piece of this universe, isn't he? The creator of all things. So his creative power also is recreative as well. And isn't that something we all need? Uh, Romans. The passage that uh, Dio read for our scripture reading. I have it here in the King James. And I'm going to read it from the clear word and see if it is easier to understand. Romans chapter 5, starting with verse 12 to the end of the chapter. Because of Adam's sin... A sinful nature was passed on to everyone in the world. From then on, sin has controlled everyone. All of us have sinned, so all must die. It's a fact that death and sin were in the world even before the law was written at Sinai, but God doesn't charge people as being guilty of sin if there is no law. Yet the law was there because people died from Adam to Moses before the law was written out even if they did not sin against a direct command given by God as Adam had. In spite of what Adam passed on to us, in one sense he does typify Christ, but what a difference there is between them. The effects of Adam's sin came to all of us without a choice on our part, but the gift of God's grace is effective only if we choose to receive it. The similarity is that if one man's sin can pass on death to all of us, how much more can God's free gift of grace through another man, Jesus Christ, be extended to all of us? Adam's sin <clears throat> brought condemnation, but through the one act of grace, the death of Jesus Christ, many sins are now covered, and we are made right with God. If by one man's sin death reigned, 
how much more will the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness received into the life reign through the sin sinlessness of another man, Jesus Christ? As condemnation came to everyone because of one sinful act, so through one work of righteousness by Jesus Christ, justification is offered to all as a passport to life, that is, eternal life. If by one, man, one man's disobedience many were made sinners, then by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. So the written law was given to increase awareness of sin and of our need for a savior. But as sin continued to increase, so grace increased that much more. Just as sin reigns over everyone through the power of death, so grace reigns through the righteousness of Jesus Christ unto eternal life over all who believe. Is that easier to catch? Hopefully more so as we go along. What is the source of righteousness? Hmm, I guess that's the end of it. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Oh, I was gonna skip those, but that's a good scripture. Here we go. What is the source of righteousness? Oh Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee. Psalm 145, verse 17, the Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. Psalm 36, 6, thy righteousness is like the great mountains. Psalm 119, 142, the righteousness, thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and thy law is the truth. Psalm 11, verse 7, for the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. Psalm 92, 15, to show that the Lord is upright, he is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. So the only source of righteousness is God himself. We can't generate it on our own. In fact, the Bible tells us that our righteousness is what? As filthy rags, won't go into detail about the real meaning of that phrase, um, but yes, filthy rags is our righteousness. When we start to think that we're doing pretty well, we need to beware, don't we? What is the nature of righteousness? What is it like? 1 Corinthians 15, verse 34, awake to righteousness and sin not. What can we learn from this verse? Righteousness and sin are the opposite ends of the spectrum. Ephesians 4, 22 to 24, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So appreciated um, the uh, spirit of prophecy quote that Carolyn shared with us this morning, because it teaches us that yes, we can be overcomers. In ourselves, we can't, the more we try, the, the more we fail, uh, but it is possible. In fact, of the promises to the churches in Revelation, the early chapters, the seven churches there, all the promises were to the overcomers. Why would he promise it to the overcomers if it's not possible? And the idea of a new man and an old man The old man is what we're really comfortable with. <clears throat> that really appeals to us. Except in those, those moments when uh, we're very receptive to the Holy Spirit showing us who we are. Then it doesn't look so good and doesn't feel so good either. Those are moments that we should cherish because there's an influence there. God is attempting to come to us to open our eyes 
to our great need. We don't come to God unless we see our need. So we need to be reminded. So when you have a circumstance that is unpleasant and rattles your cage, so to speak, and helps you to see where you need to grow, that's a time to be thankful to God. And praise him for it, for those are his efforts to reach you with more and more of his grace. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 to 10. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. We are sometimes in darkness. Hopefully only sometimes. The light is shining. Pilgrim's progress, the, the phrase was constantly there. Keep your eye on the light. Don't be looking down in the darkness. Keep your eye on the light. That's a struggle sometimes, but it's a struggle worthwhile. 1 Timothy 6, verse 11. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Those are um, cohorts of righteousness. Good things, huh? Godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. 1 John 5, 17 adds to our understanding, all unrighteousness is sin. All unrighteousness is sin. Hebrews 1.9, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. It is possible for us to come to the place where we love righteousness and hate sin. May that be more true of us as each day passes. But we see again there the, the just juxtaposition of righteousness and sin. They're on opposites, opposite ends. So how are we to relate to his righteousness? Is this righteousness inherent in our human nature? Romans 23, 3.23 answers that question. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No question. It's not part of our nature naturally. Romans 7, 14, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin, aren't we all? Romans 3, 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 7, 18, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Oftentimes there's a gap between uh, an intellectual understanding and our actual practice, isn't there? Lots of people have left God's church because of that distance. So it's a room for improvement for all of us. Romans one twenty nine. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness. That's our natural state. And what follows after there is a long list of sin. I'm not going to belabor that point. Um, but when we're filled with unrighteousness, these things come along. If we're filled with God, Christ's righteousness, then other things come along. We think of the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. But I want to, to show you a place here where I would caution um, against using the clear word as a study Bible. Because there's something here that's, that's missed. I want you to jump down to, um, I forget what verse that is. It starts with who, 
knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. I want to read to you what the clear word says. Verse um, 32, thank you. They know God's law in their hearts, and that they have no right to go on polluting their own bodies. Nevertheless, they not only do the things just mentioned, but give their approval to those who do them. King James says, but have pleasure in them that do them. There's something there that's missing in the clear word. And I want to point it out in the King James. How is it that a person is to have pleasure in someone else sinning? They have to know about it, don't they? To have some pleasure in someone else sinning. So somehow they have to perceive that person sinning through their senses, hearing, seeing, listening, touching. Uh, let your imagination run to how you can do those things with respect to other people's sin. But unrighteousness moves you to have pleasure in those that are sinning. Uh, I want to look at the testimonies of people who have acquired righteousness that the Bible tells us about. First one is Abel. You remember Abel is the son of Adam and Eve. Matthew 23, 35, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Barachias. Barachias? Hmm. Whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Also Hebrews 11, 4, by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he, being dead, yet speaketh. You remember the story of Abel and Cain um, in the Garden of Eden. They were, well, they weren't in the Garden of Eden, pardon me. Um, they were the sons of Adam and Eve, and they both brought sacrifices to God. Abel says here, um, he brought unto God, offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. How is it more excellent? Thank you. It was what God asked for. Yes, indeed. Does that make a difference in our worship? I believe it does. So what did Cain bring as an offering? He brought things that he grew. Ron, I like the way you put it. He brought what he wanted. It was a worship style that he determined for himself, that he liked. But it wasn't what God offered or what God asked for. So was it a surrendered sacrifice? No. No. Let's go on. Next one's Noah. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. And again in Genesis 6, 9, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Now we might point out here that even though this scripture uh, refers to Noah as a just man and perfect in his generations, we know from other passages of the scripture that Noah sinned, don't we? Okay, so how is it that a sinner can be called, referred to as perfect in his generations? How is that possible? My wife says, by the righteousness of Christ, thank you. That is the only way. That is the only way. Um, Romans chapter 4 and verse 3, looking at the example of Abraham. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So belief is important. Uh, and here we have Lot, 2 Peter 2, 7 and 8. And deliver just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelleth among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul, 
from day to day with their unlawful deeds. There's a couple of things to point out here that I think are interesting. One is that sometimes we might be tempted to think that it would be easier to live a life of righteousness if things weren't so difficult around here. Well, here we have Lot, who's living in a very, very wicked place, and yet the Bible refers to him as righteous. The other thing I wanted to point out is what did his experience um, bring about in him as he witnessed this sin around him? Was it what we read in Romans chapter 1 and verse 32, that he took pleasure in them that do them? No, it was something completely different vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Why the difference? When we have the righteousness of Christ in our hearts, in our experience, we're going to see sin the same way God does. If we don't see sin that way now, we know we have some room for improvement. Here's two more, Zechariah and Elizabeth, Luke chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zechariah of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. That's what's possible for us as we surrender to God to be blameless in his sight because he sees Jesus and not us. There's one large group that we need to, to add to our list here, and that is the Gentiles. The Jews during Jesus' day wanted to keep distance between them and the Gentiles because they saw them as just not having any hope. But that's not how Jesus looks at even uh, the saddest of us human beings. What shall we say then? This is Romans 9.30. What shall we say then that the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which, uh, which is of faith? How does righteousness come? By faith. <clears throat> so these Gentiles, in a time before, didn't follow after righteousness, but now they do. They have attained to righteousness. There is hope for even us. Uh, Romans chapter 6, verses 17 to 22. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. I just love Romans chapter six. I just highly recommend it to you. Even in the King James, this is pretty clear. In our former life, hopefully former life, we were servants of sin, but we came to the place of obeying from the heart. That's what God wants for us to do and to obey from the heart, not because we think we have to or because it looks good on the outside to other people that may be looking at us, but from the heart because we really truly want to. It's in that process that we're made free from sin, and then we become the servants of righteousness. When we were sinning, what we were doing, we, was, we were yielding to that sin, the carnal nature that's within us. When we want to live in righteousness, we have to do the same thing. Yield our members. What does yield mean? When you come to a yield sign, what does that mean? You let someone else have their way. Who do we need let, to let have his way in us? We need to let God have his way in us. What does that mean 
Who does that mean? It's not having his way in us. That means me, right? That's what we surrender, our way. Then we can have his way in us, his righteousness in us. But when we cling to our way, then we shut out God. <clears throat> Let's go on. Second Peter chapter 2, 7 and 8. We have this again. Um, so how do we accomplish righteousness? Let's talk some more about that. And deliver just lot, vexed from, with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Surrender of our heart to see things the way God sees them. Let's go on. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. What's revealed? Righteousness is revealed in us. The righteousness of God is revealed in us. How? By the way we live. Do we live by faith? Or do we live by our own reason? I want to turn now to the clear word. And I'm going to put the King James up on the screen for you. I'm going to look first at Romans chapter 3, verses 20 to 26. Therefore, no one can be made right with God just by keeping the law. The law can't justify anyone. All it can do is tell us what sin is. But God has given us a righteousness that is apart from keeping the law, and throughout the scriptures, the prophets bear witness to this fact. This righteousness is found in God's own Son, and he offers it to anyone whose faith rests in Jesus Christ. And I do mean anyone, for God is never partial. All of us have sinned and fallen short of reflecting the image and glory of God. We are made right with God solely by his grace, freely given, and stand acquitted before the law, our penalty paid by Jesus Christ. God has presented Jesus to the world as the mercy seat sprinkled with blood to show that he is just and that his patience of the past did not overlook our sin. He did, not, he did this not only to demonstrate his justice, but to show us that he has a right to justify anyone who has placed his faith in Christ. So there's a quote I want to share with you from the book Christ Our Righteousness by A.G. Daniels. Uh, this sermon is, is taken largely from the first chapter of this book. This is quite a, uh, an interesting explanation of how this all works. It is through faith in the blood of Christ that all the sins of the believer are canceled. All the sins of the believer are canceled. And the righteousness of God is put in their place to the believer's account. Oh, what a marvelous transaction! What is a transaction? A give and take. You go to the store and you pick out something you want. You take it to the, to the clerk and the cash register and they take your money and you have your thing that you wanted. That's a transaction. What does Jesus offer us? Righteousness. What does he, what does he want us to offer back to him? Our sin, self. Now, when you think about bargains, Jesus' righteousness compared to our sin, oh my goodness. Oh, what a marvelous transaction. What a manifestation of divine love and grace. Here is a man born in sin. As Paul says, he is filled with all unrighteousness and his, his inheritance of evil is the worst imaginable. 
His environment is at the lowest depths known to the wicked. In some way, the love of God shining from the cross of Calvary reaches that man's heart. He yields, repents, confesses, and by faith claims Christ as his savior. The instant that is done, he is accepted as a child of God. His sins are forgiven, all forgiven. His guilt is canceled. He is accounted righteous and stands approved, justified before the divine law. And this amazing, miraculous change may take place in one short hour. Yes, it is possible. This is righteousness by faith. Now, we can't expect that when we engage in this transaction, in this one short hour as referred to here, it can happen in a minute, that we are forever sinless after that. This transaction needs maintenance. It needs to be renewed. Paul said, I die daily. We need to die every minute to self because self was always clamoring for attention. And as we maintain this, God can give us victory after victory after victory. Now let's look again at the example of Abraham. This is in chapter four, Romans chapter four. And I'm gonna again be reading from the clear word. Now what about our father Abraham? How does his life fit into this picture? The same rule applies to him. If he could stand blameless before the universe on the basis of what he had done, then he would have something to boast about, but not in the presence of a holy God. What do the scriptures say about Abraham? They say that he trusted God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Is God worthy of our trust? Yes. Verses five and six. There is no work man can do to be saved, but he who trusts God as the one who makes the ungodly righteous, his faith is credited to him as righteousness. David said the same thing when he described the happiness of the man to whom God credits righteousness without that man having worked for it. Then we're going to go to verse 9. But I want to read to you the clear word, uh, verses 7 and 8, because it leads up to and gives greater understanding when I read verse 9. Verse 7, happy are the people whose wickedness is forgiven and whose sins are covered. Happy is the man whose sins the Lord does not hold against him. Verse 9, <clears throat> can this happiness be experienced only if a man has undergone the ritual of circumcision? Or can those who are not circumcised experience this too? We just said that Abraham put his faith in God and it was credited to him as righteousness. So the circumcision and the uncircumcision is in reference to works. Do you have to do good works before you experience justification? Do we somehow earn the right to come to Jesus by doing good works? Can we earn anything from God by doing good works? No, we can't. So yes, salvation is available to uncircumcision. So next let's go to Romans chapter four, verses 21 to 25, again in the clear word. Abraham never doubted that God had the power to keep his promise to give him and his descendants their inheritance. That's why Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. The words credited to him were not written for him alone, but also for us who have the same faith in God. He has demonstrated his power to keep his promise by raising Jesus Christ from the dead. Jesus was handed over to die for our sins and was raised from the dead to make us right with God. 
Praise the Lord. Now I found a, um, well, there was a quotation in, in the book, Christ Our Righteousness, but I went back and read uh, uh, this quotation is from uh, an article that Ellen White wrote in 1890. This is two years after 1888 when the message of righteousness by faith was given to the church. Awesome article. I recommend that you read the whole thing. Uh, and it's not very long even. It's only nine paragraphs. Uh, <clears throat> the title of the article is, uh, I had it here. Christ, the way of life. This is... Uh, Paragraph four from that article. But while God can be just and yet justify the sinner through the merits of Christ, no man can cover his soul with the garments of Christ's righteousness while practicing known sins or neglecting known duties. God requires the entire surrender of the heart before justification can take place. And in order for man to retain justification, there must be continual obedience through active living faith that works by love and purifies the soul. Now, I don't want anyone to be scared by this quote. In order to retain justification, we have to render continual obedience. How can we do that? Can we do that? Do we have strength to do that? No. The way that we do that is by abiding in Christ, letting him live in us, empowering us to do the things that he's asking us to do. When we maintain that, our lives can be lives of uninterrupted victories. That's an awesome thought, but it is possible. Let's go on, the same article, uh, paragraph seven. Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. That's Romans 4. Verses three to five, we read those earlier. Righteousness is obedience to the law. The law demands righteousness, and this the sinner owes to the law, but he is incapable of rendering it. The only way in which he can attain to righteousness is through faith. That's the path that God has given to us, the path of faith to grasp hold of the righteousness of Christ. <clears throat> in that transaction, a continual transaction, constantly maintained and um, continually lived out. By faith, he can bring to God the merits of Christ, and the Lord places the obedience of his son, Jesus, to the sinner's account. What a wonderful thing to have the, the record of sinlessness of Jesus' life accounted to us. Christ's righteousness is accepted in the place of man's failure, and God receives, pardons, justifies the repentant, believing soul, treats him as though he were righteous, and loves him as he loves his son. We don't deserve any of that, do we? But he gives it to us anyway, in his, out of his heart of love. This is how faith is accounted righteousness, and the pardoned soul goes on from grace to grace, from light to, from light to a greater light, he can say with rejoicing, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration. We need that washing of regeneration all the time, every day. And renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Praise the Lord. Now, here's another wonderful verse from Romans chapter five and verse one. Here's what the clear word says. Therefore, since we have been put right with God through faith, you like that? Put right with God through faith. We have peace with him through Jesus Christ, for now we know how very much he loves us. Romans chapter nine. 30 to 32. What shall we say then? Let's go to the clear word. <clears throat> Romans chapter 9, verses 30 to 32. What do we conclude from all of this? The Gentiles who have been living by our moral standards have been accepted by God because 
When they learned about him, they put their faith in him as Abraham did. But the descendants of Abraham, we might put in here Seventh-day Adventists, who tried to live by the law to make themselves acceptable to God, never did reach the point of his acceptance. Let me read that again, and I'll leave out my addition. But the descendants of Abraham who tried to live by the law to make themselves acceptable to God never did reach the point of, this, of his acceptance. Why not? Because they stumbled over the one who had come to help them. Because they were trying to do it on their own. Can we do it on our own? No. All such efforts will fail. Romans chapter 10, verses 3 and 4. Again, the clear word says, <clears throat> They don't seem to understand what God has done to put them right with him. Let me start at the beginning with verse 1 to get the, so you have the, the context there. Chapter 10, starting with verse 1. Brothers, my most earnest desire and constant prayer to God is that all Israel be saved. That is the heart of God, that he's not willing that any should perish. He wants all, everyone to be saved. But will everyone be saved? Only those that choose. I'm the first to acknowledge that they are very zealous for God. That's verse 2. But it is not based on true knowledge and insight. They don't seem to understand what God has done to put them right with him. Too many people are trying to earn their way into heaven instead of depending on what God has already done for them. Christ's sacrifice should make it evident that law-keeping is not a means of salvation. Righteousness comes from faith in Christ, not from keeping the law. But when we have the righteousness in, of Christ in our hearts, we will be keeping the law. But it's not out of our efforts to keep the law. It's because Christ is in us, and he keeps the law. Going on to verses 8 to 10 in Romans chapter 10. Again from the clear word. It says, Then he said, God's message of salvation is right here with you. His, he's written his law in your hearts and put his word in your mouths. That's the same faith that I'm proclaiming. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is your Savior and Lord and in your heart believe that God raised him from the dead, you will have the kind of relationship with God that you need. Faith is a matter of the heart. It is by faith that we come to Christ and are justified. So we live for God, not in order to be saved, but because we are saved. That's an important distinction. I want to close with two quotes. One again from A.G. Daniels in the book, Christ Our Righteousness, and the other from the book, Mount of Blessing, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing. First from A.G. Daniels, Christ Our Righteousness, page 21. Righteousness is a transaction, an experience. It is a submitting unto the righteousness of God. It is a change of standing before God and his law. It is a regeneration, a new birth. Without this change, there can be no hope for the sinner, for he will remain under the condemnation of God's changeless, holy law. Its terrible penalty will still hang over his head. Wouldn't you rather accept Jesus' sacrifice, paying the penalty for your sin? I would. And lastly, this um, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 107. This name is hallowed by the angels of heaven, by the inhabitants of unfallen worlds. When you pray, hallowed be thy name, you ask that it may be hallowed in this world, hallowed in you. God has acknowledged you before men and angels as his child. Pray that you may do no dishonor to the worthy name by which ye are called, James 2.7. God sends you into the world, as his representative, he sends all of us into the world as his representative. In every act of life, you are to make manifest the name of God. 
This petition calls upon you to possess his character. Another way you could say that is to possess his righteousness. You cannot hallow his name, you cannot represent him to the world unless in life and character you represent the very life and character of God. This you can do only through the acceptance of the grace and righteousness of Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you for offering to us this marvelous transaction of trading our sin for the righteousness of Christ. Thank you so much, Lord. Help us to engage with you in this transaction every moment of every day, that even the thoughts and intents of our hearts would be only of you that we might rightly represent you to those around us. Forgive us, Father, for the ways that we have fallen short in this. And we've behaved like sinning human beings, doing what comes naturally. But we pray for not only your forgiveness, but your cleansing from all of our unrighteousness. And that you'd strengthen and encourage us to look up, to keep our eyes on the light, that is forever shining on our pathway, seeking to lead us ever closer to yourself. Thank you for the light. Help us to walk in it, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.